Chapters 44 and 45 of Don Quixote, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume 2, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by William Ormsby. Chapters 44 and 45. Chapter 44. How Sancho Panza was conducted to his government, and of the strange adventure that befell Don Quixote in the castle. It is stated, they say, in the true original of this history, that when Cide Amete came to write this chapter, his interpreter did not translate it as he wrote it, that is, as a kind of complaint the Moor made against himself for having taken in hand a story so dry and of so little variety as this of Don Quixote, for he found himself forced to speak perpetually of him and Sancho, without venturing to indulge in digressions and episodes more serious and more interesting. He said, too, that to go on, mind, hand, pen always restricted to writing upon one single subject, and speaking through the mouths of a few characters, was intolerable drudgery, the result of which was never equal to the author's labor, and that to avoid this he had in the first part availed himself of the device of novels, like The Ill-Advised Curiosity and The Captive Captain, which stand, as it were, apart from the story. The others are given there being incidents which occurred to Don Quixote himself, and could not be omitted. He also thought, he says, that many, engrossed by the interest attaching to the exploits of Don Quixote, would take none in the novels, and pass them over hastily or impatiently, without noticing the elegance and art of their composition, which would be very manifest were they published by themselves, and not as mere adjuncts to the crazes of Don Quixote or the simplicities of Sancho. Therefore in this second part he thought it best not to insert novels, either separate or interwoven, but only episodes, something like them, arising out of the circumstances the facts present, and even these sparingly, and with no more words than to suffice to make them plain, and as he confines and restricts himself to the narrow limits of the narrative, though he has the ability, capacity, and brains enough to deal with the whole universe, he requests that his labors may not be despised, and that credit be given him, not alone for what he writes, but for what he has refrained from writing. And so he goes on with his story, saying that the day Don Quixote gave the counsels to Sancho, the same afternoon after dinner he handed them to him in writing, so that he might get some one to read them to him. They had scarcely, however, been given to him, when he let them drop, and they fell into the hands of the duke, who showed them to the duchess, and they were both amazed afresh at the madness and wit of Don Quixote. To carry on the joke, then, the same evening they dispatched Sancho with a large following to the village that was to serve him for an island. It happened that the person who had him in charge was a major domo of the duke's, a man of great discretion and humor, and there can be no humor without discretion and the same who played the part of the Countess Trifaldi in the comical way that has been already described, and thus qualified and instructed by his master and mistress as to how to deal with Sancho, he carried out their scheme admirably. Now it came to pass that as soon as Sancho saw this major domo, he seemed in his features to recognize those of the Trifaldi, and turning to his master he said to him, Senor, either the devil will carry me off, here on this spot, righteous in believing, or your worship will own to me that the face of this major-domo of the duke's here is the very face of the distressed one. Don Quixote regarded the major-domo attentively, and having done so said to Sancho, There is no reason why the devil should carry thee off, Sancho, either righteous or believing, and what thou meanest by that I know not. The face of the distressed one is that of the major-domo, but for all that the major-domo is not the distressed one, for his being so would involve a mighty contradiction." but this is not the time for going into questions of the sort, which would be involving ourselves in an inextricable labyrinth. Believe me, my friend, we must pray earnestly to our Lord, that he deliver us both from wicked wizards and enchanters. It is no joke, senor, said Sancho, for before this I heard him speak, and it seemed exactly as if the voice of the Trifaldi was sounding in my ears. Well, I'll hold my peace." but I'll take care to be on the lookout henceforth for any sign that may be seen to confirm or to do away with the suspicion. Thou wilt do well, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and thou wilt let me know all thou discoverest, and all that befells thee in thy government. 
Sancho at last set out, attended by a great number of people. He was dressed in the garb of a lawyer, with a gabin of tawny-watered camlet over all, and a montera cap of the same material, and mounted a la jineta upon a mule. Behind him, in accordance with the duke's orders, followed Dapple with brand new ass trappings and ornaments of silk, and from time to time Sancho turned round to look at his ass, so well pleased to have him with him, that he would not have changed places with the Emperor of Germany. On taking leave he kissed the hands of the Duke and Duchess, and got his master's blessing, which Don Quixote gave him with tears, and he received blubbering. Let worthy Sancho go in peace, and good luck to him, gentle reader, and look out for two bushels of laughter, which the account of how he behaved himself in office will give thee. In the meantime turn thy attention to what happened his master the same night, and if thou dost not laugh thereat, at any rate thou wilt stretch thy mouth with a grin, for Don Quixote's adventures must be honored either with wonder or with laughter. It is recorded, then, that as soon as Sancho had gone, Don Quixote felt his loneliness, and had it been possible for him to revoke the mandate and take away the government from him, he would have done so. The Duchess observed his dejection, and asked him why he was melancholy. Because, she said, if it was for the loss of Sancho, there were squires, duenas, and damsels in her house who would wait upon him to his full satisfaction. The truth is, senora, replied Don Quixote, that I do feel the loss of Sancho, but that is not the main cause of my looking sad, and of all the offers your excellence makes me, I accept only the good will with which they are made, and as to the remainder, I entreat of your excellence to permit and allow me alone to wait upon myself in my chamber." Indeed, Señor Don Quixote, said the Duchess, that must not be. Four of my damsels, as beautiful as flowers, shall wait upon you. To me, said Don Quixote, they will not be flowers, but thorns to pierce my heart. They, or anything like them, shall as soon enter my chamber as fly. If your highness wishes to gratify me still further, though I deserve it not, permit me to please myself and wait upon myself in my own room for I place a barrier between my inclinations and my virtue, and I do not wish to break this rule through the generosity your highness is disposed to display towards me, and, in short, I will sleep in my clothes sooner than allow any one to undress me. Say no more, Señor Don Quixote, say no more, said the Duchess. I assure you I will give orders that not even a fly, not to say a damsel, shall enter your room. I am not the one to undermine the propriety of Señor Don Quixote, for it strikes me that among his many virtues, the one that is pre-eminent is that of modesty. Your worship may undress and dress in private, and in your own way, as you please and when you please, for there will be no one to hinder you. And in your chamber you will find all the utensils requisite to supply the wants of one who sleeps with his door locked, to the end that no natural needs compel you to open it. May the great Dulcinea del Toboso live a thousand years, and may her fame extend over all the surface of the globe, for she deserves to be loved by a knight so valiant and so virtuous, and may kind heaven infuse zeal into the heart of our governor Sancho Panza, to finish off his discipline speedily, so that the world may once more enjoy the beauty of so grand a lady. To which Don Quixote replied, Your Highness has spoken like what you are. From the mouth of a noble lady nothing bad can come and Dulcinea will be more fortunate and better known to the world by the praise of your highness than by all the eulogies the great orators on earth could bestow upon her. Well, well, Señor Don Quixote, said the Duchess, is nearly supper-time, and the Duke is probably waiting. Come, let us go to supper, and retire to rest early, for the journey you made yesterday from Candy was not such a short one, but it must have caused you some fatigue. I feel none, Señora, said Don Quixote, for I would go so far as to swear to your excellence that in all my life I never mounted a quieter beast, or a pleasanter paced one, than Clavileño, and I don't know what could have induced Malambruno to discard a steed so swift and so gentle, and burn it so recklessly as he did. Probably, said the Duchess, repenting of the evil he had done to the Trifaldi and company and others, and the crimes he must have committed as a wizard and enchanter, he resolved to make away with all the instruments of his craft so he burned Cavaleño as the chief one, and that which mainly kept him restless, wandering from land to land, and by its ashes and the trophy of the placard the valor of the great Don Quixote of La Mancha is established forever. 
Don Quixote renewed his thanks to the Duchess, and having supped, retired to his chamber alone, refusing to allow anyone to enter with him and to wait on him. Such was his fear of encountering temptations that might lead or drive him to forget his chaste fidelity to his lady Dulcinea, for he had always present to his mind the virtue of Amadis, that flower and mirror of knights errant. He locked the door behind him, and by the light of two wax candles undressed himself, but as he was taking off his stockings, oh, disaster unworthy of such a personage! There came a burst, not of sighs or anything belying his delicacy or good breeding, but of some two dozen stitches in one of his stockings that made it look like a window lattice. The worthy gentleman was beyond measure distressed, and at that moment he would have given half an ounce of silver to have had half a drachm of green silk there. I say green silk because the stockings were green. Here Cide Amete exclaimed as he was writing, O oh, poverty, poverty, I know not what could have possessed the great Cordovan poet to call thee holy gift ungratefully received. Though a Moor, I know well enough from the intercourse I have had with Christians that holiness consists in charity, humility, faith, obedience, and poverty. But for all that, I say he must have a great deal of godliness who can find any satisfaction in being poor, unless, indeed, it be the kind of poverty one of their greatest saints refers to, saying, Possess all things as though ye possessed them not, which is what they call poverty in spirit. But thou, that other poverty, for it is of thee I am speaking now, why dost thou love to fall out with gentlemen and men of good birth more than with other people? Why dost thou compel them to smear the cracks in their shoes, and to have the buttons of their coats, one silk, another hair, and another glass? Why must their ruffs be always crinkled like endive leaves, and not crimped with a crimping iron? From this we may perceive the antiquity of starch and crimped ruffs. Then he goes on. Poor gentleman of good family, always cockering up his honor, dining miserably and in secret, and making a hypocrite of the toothpick with which he sallies out into the street, after eating nothing to oblige him to use it. Poor fellow, I say, with his nervous honor, fancying they perceive a league off, the patch on his shoe, and sweat stains on his hat, the shabbiness of his cloak, and the hunger of his stomach. All this was brought home to Don Quixote by the bursting of his stitches, However, he comforted himself on perceiving that Sancho had left behind a pair of travelling boots which he resolved to wear the next day. At last he went to bed, out of spirits and heavy at heart, as much because he missed Sancho as because of the irreparable disaster to his stockings, the stitches of which he would have even taken up with silk of another colour, which is one of the greatest signs of poverty a gentleman can show in the course of his never-failing embarrassments. He put out the candles, but the night was warm and he could not sleep. He rose from his bed and opened slightly a grated window that looked out on a beautiful garden, and as he did so he perceived and heard people walking and talking in the garden. He set himself to listen attentively, and those below raised their voices so that he could hear these words. Urge me not to sing, Emerencia, for thou knowest that ever since this stranger entered the castle and my eyes beheld him, I cannot sing but only weep. Besides, my lady is a light rather than a heavy sleeper, and I would not, for all the wealth of the world, that she found us here. And even if she were asleep and did not waken, my singing would be in vain, if this strange Aeneas, who has come into my neighborhood to flout me, sleeps on and awakens not to hear it. Heed not that, dear Altisidora, replied a voice. The Duchess is no doubt asleep, and everybody in the house save the lord of thy heart and disturber of thy soul for just now I perceived him open the grated window of his chamber, so he must be awake. Sing, my poor sufferer, in a low sweet tone to the accompaniment of thy harp, and even if the duchess hears us, we can lay the blame on the heat of the night. That is not the point, Emerencia, replied Altisidora. It is that I would not that my singing should lay bare my heart, and that I should be thought a light and wanton maiden by those who know not the mighty power of love. But come what may, better a blush on the cheeks than a sore in the heart. And here a harp softly touch made itself heard. As he listened to all this, Don Quixote was in a state of breathless amazement, for immediately the countless adventures like this, with windows, gratings, gardens, serenades, love-makings, and languishings, that he had read of in his trashy books of chivalry, came to his mind. He at once concluded that some damsel of the duchesses was in love with him, and that her modesty forced her to keep her passion secret. 
he trembled lest he should fall, and made an inward resolution not to yield, and commending himself with all his might and soul to his lady Dulcinea, he made up his mind to listen to the music, and to let them know he was here he gave a pretended sneeze, at which the damsels were not a little delighted, for all they wanted was that Don Quixote should hear them. So having tuned the harp, Altisidora, running her hand across the strings, began this ballad. O thou that art above in bed, between the holland sheets, a lying there from night till morn, with outstretched legs asleep. O thou, most valiant knight of all, the famed Manchegan breed, of purity and virtue more than gold of Araby. Give ear unto a suffering maid, well grown but evil starred, for those two sons of thine have lit a fire within her heart. Adventures seeking thou dost rove, to others bringing woe. Thou scatterest wounds, but ah, the balm, to heal them dost withhold. Say, valiant youth, and so may God, thy enterprises speed, didst thou the light mid Libya's sands, or Jacka's rocks first see? Did scaly serpents give thee suck? Who nursed thee when a babe? Wert cradled in the forest rude, or gloomy mountain cave? O Dulcinea may be proud, that plump and lusty maid, for she alone hath had the power a tiger fierce to tame. And she for all this shall famous be, from Tagus to Harama, from Manzanares to Henil, from Duero to Arlanza. Fain would I change with her, and give a petticoat to boot, the best and bravest that I have, all trimmed with gold galoon. O oh, for to be the happy fair, thy mighty arms enfold, or even sit beside thy bed, and scratch thy dusty pole. I rave, to favors such as these, unworthy to aspire, thy feet to tickle were enough, for one so mean as I. What caps, what slippers silver-laced, would I on thee bestow? What damask breeches make for thee, what fine long holland cloaks? And I would give thee pearls that should, as big as oak galls show, so matchless big that each might well be called the great alone. Manchegan Nero, look not down from thy Tarpeian rock, upon this burning heart nor add the fuel of thy wrath. A virgin soft and young am I, not yet fifteen years old. I'm only three months past fourteen, I swear upon my soul. I hobble not, nor do I limp, all blemish I'm without, and as I walk my lily locks are trailing to the ground. And though my nose be rather flat, and though my mouth be wide, my teeth like topazes exalt my beauty to the sky. Thou knowest that my voice is sweet, that is, if thou dost hear, and I am moulded in a form somewhat below the mean. These charms and many more are thine, spoils to thy spear and bow all. A damsel of this house am I, my name Altisidora. Here the lay of the heart sick in Altisidora came to an end, while the warmly wooed Don Quixote began to feel alarm, and with a deep sigh he said to himself, Oh, that I should be such an unlucky knight that no damsel can set eyes on me but falls in love with me. Oh, that the peerless Dulcinea should be so unfortunate that they cannot let her enjoy my incomparable constancy in peace. What would ye with her, ye queens? Why do ye persecute her, ye empresses? Why ye pursue her, ye virgins of from fourteen to fifteen? Leave the unhappy being to triumph, rejoice, and glory in the lot love has been pleased to bestow upon her, in surrendering my heart and yielding up my soul to her. Ye love-smitten host, know that to Dulcinea only I am dough and sugar-paste, flint to all others. For her I am honey, for you aloes. For me Dulcinea alone is beautiful, wise, virtuous, graceful, and high-bred, and all others are ill-favored, foolish, light, and low-born." Nature sent me into the world to be hers and no others. Altisidora may weep or sing, the lady for whose sake they belabored me in the castle of the enchanted moor may give way to despair, but I must be Dulcinea's, boiled or roast, pure, courteous, and chaste, in spite of all the magic-working powers on earth. And with that he shut the window with a bang, and, as much out of temper and out of sorts as if some great misfortune had befallen him, stretched himself on his bed, where we will leave him for the present, as the great Sancho Panza, who is about to set up his famous government, now demands our attention. Chapter 45 Of how the great Sancho Panza took possession of his island, and of how he made a beginning in governing. O perpetual discoverer of the antipodes, torch of the world, 
Eye of Heaven, sweet stimulator of the water coolers. Thimbraeus here, Phoebus there, now archer, now physician, father of poetry, inventor of music, thou that always risest, and, notwithstanding appearances, never settest. To thee, O son, by whose aid man begetteth man, to thee I appeal to help me and enlighten the darkness of my wit, that I may be able to proceed with scrupulous exactitude in giving an account of the great Sancho Panza's government, for without thee I feel myself weak, feeble, and uncertain. To come to the point, then, Sancho with all his attendants arrived at a village of some thousand inhabitants, and one of the largest the duke possessed. They informed him that it was called the island of Barataria, either because the name of the village was Baratario, or because of the joke by way of which the government had been conferred upon him. On reaching the gates of the town, which was a walled one, the municipality came forth to meet him, the bells rang out a peal, and the inhabitants showed every sign of general satisfaction, and with great pomp they conducted him into the principal church to give thanks to God, and then with burlesque ceremonies they presented him with the keys of the town, and acknowledged him as the perpetual governor of the island of Barataria. The costume, the beard, and the fat squat figure of the new governor astonished all those who were not in the secret, and even all who were, and they were not a few. Finally, leading him out of the church, they carried him to the judgment seat and seated him on it, and the duke's majordomo said to him, It is an ancient custom in this island, Signor Governor, that he who comes to take possession of this famous island is bound to answer a question which shall be put to him, and which must be a somewhat knotty and difficult one and by his answer the people take the measure of their new governor's wit, and hail with joy or deplore his arrival accordingly. While the majordomo was making this speech, Sancho was gazing at several large letters inscribed on the wall opposite his seat, and as he could not read, he asked what it was that was painted on the wall. The answer was, Senor, there is written and recorded the day on which your lordship took possession of this island, and the inscription says, this day, the so-and-so of such-and-such -such a month and year, Señor Don Sancho Panza took possession of this island. Many years may he enjoy it. And whom do they call Don Sancho Panza? asked Sancho. Your lordship, replied the majordomo, for no other Panza but the one who is now seated in that chair has ever entered this island. Well then, let me tell you, brother, said Sancho, I haven't got the Don, nor has any one of my family ever had it. My name is plain Sancho Panza, and Sancho was my father's name, and Sancho was my grandfather's, and they were all Panzas, without any dons or donias tacked on. I suspect that in this island there are more dons than stones, but never mind. God knows what I mean, and maybe if my government lasts four days, I'll weed out these dons that no doubt are as great a nuisance as the midges, they're so plenty. Let the majordomo go on with his question, and I'll give the best answer I can, whether the people deplore or not. At this point there came into court two old men, one carrying a cane by way of a walking stick, and the one who had no stick said, Senor, some time ago I lent this good man ten gold crowns in gold, to gratify him and do him a service, on the condition that he was to return them to me whenever I should ask for them. A long time passed before I asked for them, for I would not put him to any greater straits to return them than he was when I lent them to him. But thinking he was growing careless about payment, I asked for them once and several times, and not only will he not give them back, but he denies that he owes them, and says I never lent him any such crowns, or if I did, that he repaid them, and I have no witnesses either of the loan or the payment, for he never paid me. I want your worship to put him to his oath, and if he swears he returned them to me, I forgive him the debt here and before God. What say you to this good old man, you with the stick? said Sancho. To which the old man replied, I admit, senor, that he lent them to me, but let your worship lower your staff, and as he leaves it to my oath, I'll swear that I gave them back and paid him really and truly. The governor lowered his staff, and as he did so, the old man who had the stick handed it to the other old man, to hold for him while he swore, as if he found it in his way, and then laid his hand on the cross of the staff, saying it was true the ten crowns that were demanded of him had been lent him, but that he had with his own hand given them back into the hand of the other, and that he, not recollecting it, was always asking for them. Seeing this, the great governor asked the creditor what answer he had to make to what his opponent said, 
he said that no doubt his debtor had told the truth, for he believed him to be an honest man and a good Christian, and he himself must have forgotten when and how he had given him back the crowns, and that from that time forth he would make no further demand upon him. The debtor took his stick again, and bowing his head left the court. Observing this, and how, without another word, he made off, and observing too the resignation of the plaintiff, Sancho buried his head in his bosom and remained for a short space in deep thought, with the forefinger of his right hand on his brow and nose. Then he raised his head and bade them call back the old man with the stick, for he had already taken his departure. They brought him back, and as soon as Sancho saw him, he said, Honest man, give me that stick, for I want it. Willingly, said the old man, here it is, senor, and he put it into his hand. Sancho took it and, handing it to the other old man, said to him, Go, and God be with you, for now you are paid. I, senor, returned the old man, why, is this cane worth ten gold crowns? Yes, said the governor, or if not, I am the greatest dolt in the world. Now you will see whether I have got the headpiece to govern a whole kingdom. And he ordered the cane to be broken in two, there, in the presence of all. It was done, and in the middle of it they found ten gold crowns. All were filled with amazement, and looked upon their governor as another Solomon. They asked him how he had come to the conclusion that the ten crowns were in the cane. He replied that observing how the old man who swore gave the stick to his opponent while he was taking the oath, and swore that he had really and truly given him the crowns, and how as soon as he had done swearing he asked for the stick again, it came into his head that the sum demanded must be inside it, and from this he said it might be seen that God sometimes guides those who govern in their judgments, even though they may be fools. Besides, he had himself heard the curate of his village mention just such another case, and he had so good a memory that if it was not that he forgot everything he wished to remember, there would not be such a memory in all the island. To conclude, the old men went off, one crestfallen and the other in high contentment. All who were present were astonished, and he who was recording the words, deeds, and movements of Sancho could not make up his mind whether he was to look upon him and set him down as a fool or as a man of sense. As soon as this case was disposed of, there came into the court a woman holding on with a tight grip to a man dressed like a well-to-do cattle dealer, and she came forward making a great outcry and exclaiming, Justice, Senor Governor, justice, and if I don't get it on earth, I'll go look for it in heaven. Senor Governor, of my soul, this wicked man caught me in the middle of the fields here, and used my body as if it was an ill-washed rag, and, woe is me, got for me what I had kept these three-and-twenty years and more, defending it against Moors and Christians, natives and strangers, and I always as hard as an oak, and keeping myself as pure as a salamander in the fire, or wool among the brambles, for this good fellow to come now with clean hands to handle me. It remains to be proved whether this gallant has clean hands or not, said Sancho, and turning to the man, he asked him what he had to say in answer to the woman's charge. He, all in confusion, made answer, Sirs, I am a poor pig dealer, and this morning I left the village to sell, saving your presence, four pigs, and between dues and cribbings they got out of me little less than the worth of them. As I was returning to my village, I fell in on the road with this good dame, and the devil who makes a coil and a mess out of everything yoked us together. I paid her fairly, but she, not contented, laid hold of me and never let go until she brought me here. She says I forced her, but she lies by the oath I swear, or am ready to swear. And this is the whole truth and every particle of it. The governor on this asked him if he had any money and silver about him. He said he had about twenty ducats in a leather purse in his bosom. The governor bade him take it out and hand it to the complainant. He obeyed trembling. The woman took it, and making a thousand salams to all, and praying to God for the long life and health of the senior governor, who had such regard for distressed orphans and virgins, she hurried out of court with the purse grasped in both her hands, first looking, however, to see if the money it contained was silver. As soon as she was gone, Sancho said to the cattle dealer, whose tears were already starting, and whose eyes and heart were following his purse, Good fellow, go after that woman and take the purse from her, by force even, and come back with it here. And he did not say it to one who was a fool or deaf, for the man was off like a flash of lightning and ran to do as he was bid. All the bystanders waited anxiously to see the end of the case, and presently both man and woman came back at even closer grips than before, she with her petticoat up and the purse in the lap of it, 
and he struggling hard to take it from her, but all to no purpose, so stout was the woman's defense, she all the while crying out, Justice from God and the world! See here, Señor Governor, the shameless and boldness of this villain, who in the middle of the town, in the middle of the street, wanted to take from me the purse your worship bade him give me. And did he take it? asked the governor. Take it, said the woman. I'd let my life be taken from me sooner than the purse. A pretty child I'd be. It's another sort of cat they must throw in my face, and not that poor scurvy knave. Pinchers and hammers, mallets and chisels, would not get it out of my grip. No, nor lion's claws, the soul from out of my body first. She is right, said the man. I own myself beaten and powerless. I confess I haven't the strength to take it from her, and he let go his hold of her. Upon this the governor said to the woman, Let me see that purse, my worthy and sturdy friend. She handed it to him at once, and the governor returned it to the man, and said to the unforced mistress of force, Sister, if you had shown as much, or only half as much, spirit and vigor in defending your body as you have shown in defending that purse, the strength of Hercules could not have forced you. Be off, and God speed you, and bad luck to you, and don't show your face in all this island, or within six leagues of it on any side, under pain of two hundred lashes. Be off at once, I say, you shameless cheating shrew. The woman was cowed and went off disconsolately, hanging her head. And the governor said to the man, Honest man, go home with your money, and God speed you, and for the future, if you don't want to lose it, see that you don't take it into your head to yoke with anybody. The man thanked him as clumsily as he could and went his way, and the bystanders were again filled with admiration at their new governor's judgments and sentences. Next, two men, one apparently a farm laborer, and the other a tailor, for he had a pair of shears in his hand, presented themselves before him, and the tailor said, Senor Governor, this laborer and I came before your worship by reason of this honest man coming to my shop yesterday, for saving everybody's presence I'm a past tailor, God be thanked, and putting a piece of cloth into my hands and asking me, Senor, will there be enough in this cloth to make a cap? Measuring the cloth I said there would. He probably suspected, as I supposed, and I supposed right, that I wanted to steal some of the cloth, led to think so by his own roguery and the bad opinion people have of tailors. And he told me to see if there would be enough for two. I guessed what he would be at, and I said yes. He, still following up his original unworthy notion, went on adding cap after cap, and I yes after yes, until we got as far as five. He has just this moment come for them. I gave them to him, but he won't pay me for the making." On the contrary, he calls on me to pay him, or else return his cloth. Is all this true, brother? said Sancho. Yes, replied the man, but will your worship make him show the five caps he has made me? With all my heart, said the tailor, and drawing his hand from under his cloak, he showed five caps stuck upon the five fingers of it, and said, There are the caps this good man asks for, and by God and upon my conscience I haven't a scrap of cloth left and I'll let the work be examined by the inspectors of the trade. All present laughed at the number of caps and the novelty of the suit. Sancho set himself to think for a moment, and then said, It seems to me that in this case it is not necessary to deliver long-winded arguments, but only to give off-hand the judgment of an honest man. And so my decision is that the tailor lose the making and the laborer the cloth, and that the caps go to the prisoners in the jail, and let there be no more about it. If the previous decision about the cattle dealer's purse excited the admiration of the bystanders, this provoked their laughter. However, the governor's orders were after all executed. All this, having been taken down by his chronicler, was at once dispatched to the duke, who was looking out for it with great eagerness. And here let us leave the good Sancho, for his master, sorely troubled in mind by Altisidora's music, has pressing claims upon us now. End of chapters 44 and 45《46 and 47 of Don Quixote, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume 2 by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby. Chapters 46 and 47. Chapter 46. 
of the terrible bell and cat fright that Don Quixote got in the course of the enamored Altisidora's wooing. We left Don Quixote wrapped up in the reflections which the music of the enamored maid Altisidora had given rise to. He went to bed with them, and just like the fleas they would not let him sleep or get a moment's rest, and the broken stitches of his stockings helped them. But as time is fleet and no obstacle can stay his course, he came riding on the hours, and morning very soon arrived seeing which don quixote quitted the soft down and no wise slothful dressed himself in his chamois suit and put on his travelling boots to hide the disaster to his stockings he threw over him his scarlet mantle put on his head a montera of green velvet trimmed with silver edging flung across his shoulder the baldric with his good trenchant sword took up a large rosary that he always carried with him and with great solemnity and precision of gait proceeded to the antechamber where the duke and duchess were already dressed and waiting for him but as he passed through a gallery altisidora and the other damsel her friend were lying in wait for him and the instant altisidora saw him she pretended to faint while her friend caught her in her lap and began hastily unlacing the bosom of her dress don quixote observed it and approaching them said i know very well what this seizure arises from i know not from what replied the friend for Altisidora is the healthiest damsel in all this house, and I have never heard her complain all the time I have known her. A plague on all the knights errant in the world, if they be all ungrateful. Go away, Señor Don Quixote, for this poor child will not come to herself again so long as you are here. To which Don Quixote returned, Do me the favor, Señora, to let a lute be placed in my chamber to-night, and I will comfort this poor maiden to the best of my power, for in the early stages of love a prompt disillusion is an approved remedy. And with this he retired, so as not to be remarked by any who might see him there. He had scarcely withdrawn when Altisidora, recovering from her swoon, said to her companion, The lute must be left, for no doubt Don Quixote intends to give us some music, and being his it will not be bad. They went at once to inform the Duchess of what was going on, and of the lute Don Quixote asked for, and she, delighted beyond measure, plotted with the duke and her two damsels to play him a trick that should be amusing but harmless. And in high glee they waited for night, which came quickly as the day had come, and as for the day, the duke and duchess spent it in charming conversation with Don Quixote. When eleven o'clock came, Don Quixote found a guitar in his chamber. He tried it, opened the window, and perceived that some persons were walking in the garden and having passed his fingers over the frets of the guitar, and tuned it as well as he could, he spat and cleared his chest, and then with a voice a little hoarse but full-toned, he sang the following ballad, which he had himself that day composed. Mighty love, the hearts of maidens, doth unsettle and perplex, and the instrument he uses, most of all, is idleness. Sewing, stitching, any labor, having always work to do, to the poison love instilleth, is the antidote most sure. And to proper-minded maidens, who desire the matron's name, modesty's a marriage portion, modesty their highest praise. Men of prudence and discretion, courtiers gay and gallant knights, with the wanton damsels dally, but the modest take to wife. There are passions transient fleeting, loves in hostelries declared, sunrise loves with sunset ended, when the guest hath gone his way. Love that springs up swift and sudden, here to-day, to-morrow flown, passes, leaves no trace behind it, leaves no image on the soul. Painting that is laid on painting, maketh no display or show, where one beauty in possession, there no other can take hold. Dulcinea del Toboso, painted on my heart I wear, never from its tablets, never can her image be erased. The quality of all in lovers most esteemed is constancy, it is by this that love works wonders, this exalts them to the skies. Don Quixote had got so far with his song, to which the duke, the duchess, Altisidora, and nearly the whole household of the castle were listening, when all of a sudden from a gallery above that was exactly over his window they let down a cord with more than a hundred bells attached to it, and immediately after that discharged a great sack full of cats, which also had bells of smaller size tied to their tails. Such was the din of the bells and the squalling of the cats, that though the duke and duchess were the contrivers of the joke, they were startled by it, while Don Quixote stood paralyzed with fear. 
and as luck would have it, two or three of the cats made their way in through the grating of his chamber, and flying from one side to the other, made it seem as if there were a legion of devils at large in it. They extinguished the candles that were burning in the room, and rushed about seeking some way of escape. The cord with the large bells never ceased rising and falling, and most of the people of the castle, not knowing what was really the matter, were at their wits' end with astonishment. Don Quixote sprang to his feet, and drawing his sword, began making passes at the grating, shouting out, Avant, malignant enchanters! Avant, ye witchcraft-working rabble! I am Don Quixote of La Mancha, against whom your evil machinations avail not nor have any power. And turning upon the cats that were running about the room, he made several cuts at them. They dashed at the grating and escaped by it, save one that, finding itself hard-pressed by the slashes of Don Quixote's sword, flew at his face and held on to his nose tooth and nail, with the pain of which he began to shout his loudest. The duke and duchess hearing this, and guessing what it was, ran with all haste to his room, and as the poor gentleman was striving with all his might to detach the cat from his face, they opened the door with a master key, and went in with lights and witnessed the unequal combat. The duke ran forward to part the combatants, but Don Quixote cried out aloud, Let no one take him from me! Leave me hand to hand with this demon, this wizard, this enchanter! I will teach him, I myself, who Don Quixote of La Mancha is. The cat, however, never minding these threats, snarled and held on, but at last the duke pulled it off and flung it out of the window. Don Quixote was left with a face as full of holes as a sieve, and a nose not in very good condition, and greatly vexed that they did not let him finish the battle he had been so stoutly fighting with that villain of an enchanter. They sent for some oil of John's wart, and Altisidora herself, with her own fair hands, bandaged all the wounded parts, and as she did so she said to him in a low voice, All these mishaps have befallen thee, kind-hearted knight, for the sin of thy insensibility and obstinacy, and God grant thy squire Sancho may forget to whip himself, so that that dearly beloved Dulcinea of thine may never be released from her enchantment, that thou mayest never come to her bed, at least while I who adore thee am alive. To all this Don Quixote made no answer except to heave deep sighs, and then stretched himself on his bed, thanking the duke and duchess for their kindness, not because he stood in any fear of that bell-ringing rabble of enchanters in cat shape, but because he recognized their good intentions in coming to his rescue. The duke and duchess left him to repose, and withdrew greatly grieved at the unfortunate result of the joke. They had never thought the adventure would have fallen so heavy on Don Quixote, or cost him so dear, for it cost him five days of confinement to his bed, during which he had another adventure, pleasanter than the late one, which his chronicler will not relate just now, in order that he may turn his attention to Sancho Panza, who was proceeding with great diligence and drollery in his government. Chapter 47 wherein is continued the account of how Sancho Panza conducted himself in his government. The history says that from the justice court they carried Sancho to a sumptuous palace, where in a spacious chamber there was a table laid out with royal magnificence. The clarions sounded as Sancho entered the room, and four pages came forward to present him with water for his hands, which Sancho received with great dignity. The music ceased, and Sancho seated himself at the head of the table, for there was only that seat placed, and no more than one cover laid. A personage, who it appeared afterwards was a physician, placed himself standing by his side with a whalebone wand in his hand. They then lifted up a fine white cloth covering fruit and a great variety of dishes of different sorts. One who looked like a student said grace, and a page put a laced bib on Sancho, while another who played the part of head carver placed a dish of fruit before him. But hardly had he tasted a morsel, when the man with the wand touched the plate with it, and they took it away from before him with utmost celerity. The carver, however, brought him another dish, and Sancho proceeded to try it, but before he could get at it, not to say taste it, already the wand had touched it, and a page had carried it off with the same promptitude as the fruit. Sancho, seeing this, was puzzled, and looking from one to another, asked if this dinner was to be eaten after the fashion of a jugglery trick. To this he with the wand replied, It is not to be eaten, Señor Governor, except as is usual and customary in other islands where there are governors. I, Señor, am a physician, 
and I am paid a salary in this island to serve its governors as such, and I have a much greater regard for their health than for my own, studying day and night and making myself acquainted with the governor's constitution, in order to be able to cure him when he falls sick. The chief thing I have to do is to attend at his dinners and suppers, and allow him to eat what appears to me to be fit for him, and keep from him what I think will do him harm and be injurious to his stomach and therefore I ordered that plate of fruit to be removed as being too moist, and that other dish I ordered to be removed as being too hot and containing many spices that stimulate thirst, for he who drinks much kills and consumes the radical moisture wherein life consists. Well then, said Sancho, that dish of roast partridges there that seems so savory will not do me any harm. To this the physician replied, Of those my lord the governor shall not eat so long as I live. Why so? said Sancho. Because, replied the doctor, our master Hippocrates, the pole star and beacon of medicine, says in one of his aphorisms, Omnis saturatio mala, perdices autem pessima, which means, all repletion is bad, but that of partridge is the worst of all. In that case, said Sancho, let Señor Doctor see among the dishes that are on the table what will do me most good and least harm, and let me eat it, without tapping it with his stick for by the life of the governor, and so may God suffer me to enjoy it, but I'm dying of hunger, and in spite of the doctor and all he may say, to deny me food is the way to take my life instead of prolonging it. Your worship is right, Señor Governor, said the physician, and therefore your worship, I consider, should not eat of these stewed rabbits there, because it is a furry kind of food. If that veal were not roasted and served with pickles you might try it, but it is out of the question." That big dish that is smoking farther off, said Sancho, seems to me to be an olla podrida, and out of the diversity of things in such ollas, I cannot fail to light upon something tasty and good for me. Absit, said the doctor, far from us be any such base thought. There is nothing in the world less nourishing than an olla podrida. To canons, or rectors of colleges, or peasants' weddings, with your ollas podridas, but let us have none of them on the tables of governors, where everything that is present should be delicate and refined, and the reason is that always, everywhere and by everybody, simple medicines are more esteemed than compound ones, for we cannot go wrong in those that are simple, while in the compound we may, by merely altering the quantity of the things composing them. But what I am of the opinion the governor should eat now, in order to preserve and fortify his health, is a hundred or so of wafer cakes and a few thin slices of conserve of quinces, which shall settle his stomach and help his digestion. Sancho, on hearing this, threw himself back in his chair and surveyed the doctor steadily, and in a solemn tone asked him what his name was and where he had studied. He replied, My name, Señor Governor, is Dr. Pedro Recio de Aguero. I am a native of the place called Tirtiafuera, which lies between Caracuel and Almodovar del Campo, on the right-hand side, and I have the degree of doctor from the University of Osuna to which Sancho, glowing all over with rage, returned, Then let Dr. Pedro Recio de Malaguero, native of Tirtiafuera, a place that's on the right-hand side as we go from Caracuel to Almodovar del Campo, graduate of Osuna, get out of my presence at once, or I swear by the sun I'll take a cudgel, and by dint of blows beginning with him, I'll not leave a doctor in the whole island, at least of those I know to be ignorant, for as to learned, wise, sensible physicians, them I will reverence and honor as divine persons. Once more I say let Pedro Recio get out of this, or I'll take this chair I am sitting on and break it over his head. And if they call me to account for it, I'll clear myself by saying I served God in killing a bad doctor, a general executioner. And now give me something to eat, or else take your government, for a trade that does not feed its master is not worth two beans. The doctor was dismayed when he saw the governor in such a passion, and he would have made a tirtiafuera out of the room, but at the same instant a post-horn sounded on the street, and the carver, putting his head out of the window, turned round and said, It's a courier from my lord the duke, no doubt some dispatch of importance. The courier came in, all sweating and flurried, and taking a paper from his bosom, placed it in the governor's hands. Sancho handed it to the majordomo and bade him read the superscription, which ran thus. To Don Sancho Panza, governor to the island of Barataria, into his own hands or those of his secretary. Sancho, when he heard this, said, 
which of you is my secretary? I am, senor, said one of those present, for I can read and write, and am a Biscayan. With that addition, said Sancho, you might be secretary to the emperor himself. Open this paper and see what it says. The newborn secretary obeyed, and having read the contents, said the matter was one to be discussed in private. Sancho ordered the chamber to be cleared, the majordomo and the carver only remaining, so the doctor and the others withdrew, and then the secretary read the letter, which was as follows. It has come to my knowledge, Señor Don Sancho Panza, that certain enemies of mine and of the island are about to make a furious attack upon it some night, I know not when. It behooves you to be on the alert and keep watch, that they surprise you not. I also know by trustworthy spies that four persons have entered the town in disguise in order to take your life, because they stand in dread of your great capacity. Keep your eyes open and take heed who approaches you to address you, and eat nothing that is presented to you. I will take care to send you aid if you find yourself in difficulty, but in all things you will act as may be expected of your judgment. From this place, the 16th of August, at four in the morning. Your friend, the Duke. Sancho was astonished, and those who stood by made believe to be so too, and turning to the majordomo he said to him, What we have got to do first, and it must be done at once, is to put Dr. Racio in the lock-up, for if any one wants to kill me it is he, and by a slow death and the worst of all, which is hunger. Likewise, said the carver, it is my opinion your worship should not eat anything that is on this table, for the whole was a present from some nuns, and as they say, behind the cross there's the devil. I don't deny it, said Sancho, so for the present give me a piece of bread and four pounds or so of grapes. No poison can come in them, for the fact is I can't go on without eating, and if we are to be prepared for these battles that are threatening us, we must be well provisioned, for it is the tripes that carry the heart and not the heart the tripes. And you, secretary, answer my lord the duke, and tell him that all his commands shall be obeyed to the letter, as he directs, and say from me to my lady the duchess that I kiss her hands, and that I beg of her not to forget to send my letter and bundle to my wife Teresa Panza by a messenger, and I will take it as a great favor, and will not fail to serve her in all that may lie within my power, and as you are about it, you may enclose a kiss of the hand to my master Don Quixote, that he may see I am grateful bread, and as a good secretary and a good Biscayan, you may add whatever you like, and whatever will come in best. And now take away this cloth, and give me something to eat, and I'll be ready to meet all the spies and assassins and enchanters that may come against me or my island. At this instant a page entered, saying, Here is a farmer on business, who wants to speak to your lordship on a matter of great importance, he says. It's very odd, said Sancho, the ways of these men on business. Is it possible they can be such fools as not to see that an hour like this is no hour for coming on business? We who govern, and we who are judges, are we not men of flesh and blood, and are we not to be allowed the time required for taking rest, unless they'd have us made of marble? By God and on my conscience, if the government remains in my hands, which I have a notion it won't, I'll bring more than one man on business to order. However, tell this good man to come in, but take care first of all that he is not some spy or one of my assassins. No, my lord, said the page, for he looks like a simple fellow, and either I know very little, or he is as good as good bread." There is nothing to be afraid of, said the majordomo, for we are all here. Would it be possible, Carver, said Sancho, now that Dr. Pedro Recio is not here, to let me eat something solid and substantial, if it were even a piece of bread and an onion? Tonight at supper, said the Carver, the shortcomings of the dinner shall be made good, and your lordship shall be fully contented. God grant it, said Sancho. The farmer now came in, a well-favored man that one might see a thousand leagues off was an honest fellow and a good soul. The first thing he said was, Which is the Lord Governor here? Which should it be, said the secretary, but he who is seated in the chair? Then I humble myself before him, said the farmer, and going on his knees he asked for his hand to kiss it. Sancho refused it, and bade him stand up and say what he wanted. The farmer obeyed, and then said, I am a farmer, senor, a native of Migaltura, a village two leagues from Ciudad Real. Another tirtia fuera, said Sancho. Say on, brother, I know Migaltura very well, I can tell you, for it's not very far from my own town. 
The case is this, senor, continued the farmer, that by God's mercy I am married with the leave and license of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. I have two sons, students, and the younger is studying to become bachelor, and the elder to become licentiate. I am a widower, for my wife died, or more properly speaking, a bad doctor killed her on my hands, giving her a purge when she was with child, and if it had pleased God that the child had been born, and was a boy, I would have put him to study for doctor, that he might not envy his brothers the bachelor and the licentiate. So that if your wife had not died, or had not been killed, you would not now be a widower, said Sancho. No, senor, certainly not, said the farmer. We've got that much settled, said Sancho. Get on, brother, for it's more bedtime than business time. Well then, said the farmer, this son of mine who is going to be a bachelor, fell in love in the said town with a damsel called Clara Perlerina, daughter of Andres Perlerino, a very rich farmer. And this name of Perlerines does not come to them by ancestry or descent, but because all the family are paralytics, and for a better name they call them Perlerines, though to tell the truth the damsel is as fair as an oriental pearl, and like a flower of the field, if you look at her on the right side, on the left not so much, for on that side she wants an eye that she lost by smallpox. And though her face is thickly and deeply pitted, those who love her say that they are not pits that are there, but the graves where the hearts of her lovers are buried. She is so cleanly that not to soil her face she carries her nose turned up, as they say, so that one would fancy it was running away from her mouth. And with all this she looks extremely well, for she has a wide mouth and but for wanting ten or a dozen teeth and grinders she might compare and compete with the comeliest. Of her lips I say nothing, for they are so fine and thin that, if lips might be reeled, one might make a skein of them. But being of a different color from ordinary lips, they are wonderful, for they are mottled, blue, green, and purple. Let my lord the governor pardon me for painting so minutely the charms of her, who some time or other will be my daughter, for I love her and I don't find her amiss." Paint what you will, said Sancho, I enjoy your painting, and if I had dined there would be no dessert more to my taste than your portrait. That I have still to furnish, said the farmer, but a time will come when we may be able, if we are not now. And I can tell you, senor, if I could paint her gracefulness and her tall figure, it would astonish you. But that is impossible, since she is bent double with her knees up to her mouth. But for all that, it is easy to see that if she could stand up, she'd knock her head against the ceiling and she would have given her hand to my bachelor ere this, only that she can't stretch it out, for it's contracted. But still one can see its elegance and fine make by its long furrowed nails. That will do, brother, said Sancho. Consider you have painted her from head to foot. What is it you want now? Come to the point without all this beating about the bush, and all these scraps and additions. I want your worship, senor, said the farmer to do me the favor of giving me a letter of recommendation to the girl's father, begging him to be so good as to let this marriage take place, as we are not ill-matched either in the gifts of fortune or of nature. For to tell the truth, Senor Governor, my son is possessed of a devil, and there is not a day but the evil spirits torment him three or four times, and from having once fallen into the fire, he has his face puckered up like a piece of parchment, and his eyes watery and always running, but he has the disposition of an angel, and if it was not for belaboring and pummeling himself, he'd be a saint. Is there anything else you want, good man? said Sancho. There's one other thing I'd like, said the farmer, but I'm afraid to mention it. However, out it must, for after all I can't let it be rotting in my breast, come what may. I mean, senor, that I'd like your worship to give me three hundred or six hundred ducats as a help to my bachelor's portion to help him in setting up house for they must, in short, live by themselves, without being subject to the interferences of their fathers-in-law. Just see if there's anything else you'd like, said Sancho, and don't hold back from mentioning it out of bashfulness or modesty. No, indeed there is not, said the farmer. The moment he said this, the governor started to his feet, and seizing the chair he had been sitting on, exclaimed, By all that's good, you ill-bred boorish don bumpkin, if you don't get out of this at once and hide yourself from my sight, I'll lay your head open with this chair. You horse and rascal, you devil's own painter, and is it at this hour you come to ask me for six hundred ducats? How should I have them, you stinking brute? And why should I give them to you if I had them, you knave and blockhead? 
What have I to do with Migaltura or the whole family of the Perlerins? Get out, I say, or by the life of my lord the duke I'll do as I said. You're not from Migaltera, but some knave sent here from hell to tempt me. Why, you villain, I have not yet had the government half a day, and you want me to have six hundred ducats already. The carver made signs to the farmer to leave the room, which he did with his head down, and to all appearance in terror, lest the governor should carry his threats into effect, for the rogue knew very well how to play his part. But let us leave Sancho in his wrath, and peace be with them all, and let us return to Don Quixote, whom we left with his face bandaged and doctored after the cat wounds, of which he was not cured for eight days, and on one of these there befell him what Cide Amete promises to relate with that exactitude and truth with which he is wont to set forth everything connected with this great history, however minute it may be. End of chapter 47「Don Quixote, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnold Simister. Don Quixote, Volume 2 by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, Chapter 48. Of what befell Don Quixote with Donna Rodriguez, the Duchess's duenna, together with other occurrences worthy of record and eternal remembrance. Exceedingly moody and dejected was the sorely wounded Don Quixote, with his face bandaged and marked, not by the hand of God, but by the claws of a cat, mishaps incidental to knight errantry. Six days he remained without appearing in public, and one night, as he lay awake, thinking of his misfortunes and of Altisidora's pursuit of him, he perceived that someone was opening the door of his room with a key and he at once made up his mind that the enamoured damsel was coming to make an assault upon his chastity and put him in danger of failing in the fidelity he owed to his lady Dulcinea del Toboso. No, said he, firmly persuaded of the truth of his idea, and he said it loud enough to be heard, the greatest beauty upon earth shall not avail to make me renounce my adoration of her whom I bear stamped and graved in the core of my heart and the secret depths of my bowels. Be thou, lady mine, transformed into a clumsy country wench, or into a nymph of golden tagus weaving a web of silk and gold. Let Merlin or Montesinos hold thee captive where they will. Wherever thou art, thou art mine, and wherever I am must be thine. The very instant he had uttered these words, the door opened. He stood up on the bed, wrapped from head to foot in a yellow satin coverlet, with a cap on his head, and his face and his mustaches tied up, his face because of the scratches, and his mustaches to keep them from drooping and falling down in which trim he looked the most extraordinary scarecrow that could be conceived. He kept his eyes fixed on the door, and just as he was expecting to see the love-smitten and unhappy Altisidora make her appearance, he saw, coming in, a most venerable duenna, in a long white-bordered veil that covered and enveloped her from head to foot. Between the fingers of her left hand she held a short, lighted candle, while with her right she shaded it to keep the light from her eyes, which were covered by spectacles of great size, and she advanced with noiseless steps treading very softly. Don Quixote kept an eye upon her from his watchtower, and observing her costume and noting her silence, he concluded that it must be some witch or sorceress that was coming in such a guise to work him some mischief, and he began crossing himself at a great rate. The spectre still advanced, and on reaching the middle of the room, looked up, and saw the energy with which Don Quixote was crossing himself, and if he was scared by seeing such a figure as hers, she was terrified at the sight of his. For the moment she saw his tall yellow form with the coverlet, and the bandages that disfigured him, she gave a loud scream, and exclaiming, Jesus, what's this I see? Let fall the candle in her fright. And then finding herself in the dark, turned about to make off, but stumbling on her skirts in her consternation, she measured her length with a mighty fall. Don Quixote in his trepidation began saying, I conjure thee, phantom, or whatever thou art, tell me what thou art and what thou wouldst with me. If thou art a soul in torment, say so, and all that my powers can do I will do for thee. For I am a Catholic Christian, and love to do good to all the world, and to this end I have embraced the order of knight-errantry to which I belong, the province of which extends to doing good even to souls in purgatory. The unfortunate duenna, hearing herself thus conjured, by her own fear guessed Don Quixote's, and in a low plaintive voice answered, Señor Don Quixote, if so be you are indeed Don Quixote, I am no phantom or spectre or soul in purgatory, as you seem to think, but Donna Rodriguez, 
duenna of honour to my lady the duchess, and I come to you with one of those grievances your worship is wont to redress. Tell me, Senora Donna Rodriguez, said Don Quixote, do you perchance come to transact any go-between business? Because I must tell you I am not available for anybody's purpose, thanks to the peerless beauty of my lady Dulcinea del Toboso. In short, Senora Donna Rodriguez, if you will leave out and put aside all love messages, you may go and light your candle and come back, and we will discuss all the commands you have for me and whatever you wish, saving only, as I said, all seductive communications. I carry nobody's messages, Senor, said the duenna. Little you know me. Nay, I'm not far enough advanced in years to take to any such childish tricks. God be praised, I have a soul in my body still, and all my teeth and grinders in my mouth, except one or two that the colds, so common in this Aragon country, have robbed me of. But wait a little, while I go and light my candle, and I will return immediately and lay my sorrows before you as before one who relieves those of all the world. And without staying for an answer, she quitted the room and left Don Quixote tranquilly meditating while he waited for her. A thousand thoughts at once suggested themselves to him on the subject of this new adventure, and it struck him as being ill done and worse advised in him to expose himself to the danger of breaking his plighted faith to his lady, and said he to himself, Who knows but that the devil, being wily and cunning, may be trying now to entrap me with a duenna, having filled with empresses, queens, duchesses, marchionesses, and countesses. Many a time have I heard it said by many a man of sense that he will sooner offer you a flat-nosed wench than a Roman-nosed one, and who knows but this privacy, this opportunity, this silence, may awaken my sleeping desires, and lead me in these my latter years to fall where I have never tripped. In cases of this sort it is better to flee than to await the battle, but I must be out of my senses to think and utter such nonsense, for it is impossible that a long, white-hooded, spectacled duenna could stir up or excite a wanton thought in the most graceless bosom in the world. Is there a duenna on earth that is fair flesh? Is there a duenna in the world that escapes being ill-tempered, wrinkled, and prudish? Avant, then, ye duenna crew, undelightful to all mankind. Oh, but the lady did well, who, they say, had at the end of her reception room a couple of figures of duennas with spectacles and lace cushions, as if at work, and those statues served quite well as to give an air of propriety to the room as if they had been real duennas. So saying, he leaped off the bed, intending to close the door, not allow Senor Rodriguez to enter. But as he went to shut it, Senor Rodriguez returned with a wax candle lighted, and having a closer view of Don Quixote with the coverlet round him, and his bandages and nightcap, she was alarmed afresh, and retreating a couple of paces, exclaimed, Am I safe, Sir Knight? For I don't look upon it as a sign of very great virtue that your worship should have got up out of bed. I may well ask the same, Senor, said Don Quixote, and I do ask whether I shall be safe from being assailed and forced. Of whom and against whom do you demand that security, Sir Knight, said the duenna. Of you and against you, I ask it, said Don Quixote, for I am not marble, nor are you brass, nor is it now ten o'clock in the morning, but midnight, or a trifle past it, I fancy. We are in a room more secluded and retired than the cave could have been where the treacherous and darling Anus enjoyed the soft-hearted Dido. But give me your hand, Senora. I require no better protection than my own continence and my own sense of propriety as well as that which is inspired by that venerable headdress. And so saying, he kissed her right hand and took it in his own, she yielding it to him with equal ceremoniousness. And here Sid Hammett inserts a parenthesis in which he says that to have seen the pair marching from the door to the bed, linked hand in hand in this way, he would have given the best of the two tunics he had. Don Quixote finally got into bed, and Donna Rodriguez took her seat on a chair at some little distance from his couch, without taking off her spectacles or putting aside the candle. Don Quixote wrapped the bedclothes around him and covered himself up completely, leaving nothing but his face visible, and as soon as they had both regained their composure, he broke silence, saying, Now, Senora Donna Rodriguez, you may unbosom yourself, and out with everything you have in your sorrowful heart and afflicted bowels, and by me you shall be listened to with chaste ears and aided by compassionate exertions. I believe it, replied the duenna, from your worship's gentle and winning presence, only such a Christian answer could be expected. The fact is, then, Senor Don Quixote, that though you see me seated in this chair, here in the middle of the kingdom of Aragon, and in the attire of a despised outcast duenna, I am from the Asturias of Oviedo, and of a family with whom many of the best of the provinces are connected by blood. But my untoward fate and the improvidence of my parents, who, I know not how, were unseasonably reduced to poverty, brought me to the court of Madrid, where, as a provision and to avoid greater misfortunes, my parents placed me as a seamstress in the service of a lady of quality. And I would have you know that for hemming and sewing I have never been surpassed by any in all my life. 
My parents left me in service and returned to their own country, and a few years later went, no doubt, to heaven, for they were excellent, good Catholic Christians. I was left an orphan with nothing but the miserable wages and trifling presents that are given to servants of my sort in palaces. But about this time, without any encouragement on my part, one of the esquires of the household fell in love with me, a man somewhat advanced in years, full-bearded and personable, and above all as good a gentleman as the king himself. For he came of a mountain stock. We did not carry on our love with such secrecy, but that they came to the knowledge of my lady, and she, not to have any fuss about it, had us married with the full sanction of the Holy Mother Roman Catholic Church, of which marriage a daughter was born, to put an end to my good fortune if I had any. Not that I died in childbirth, for I passed through it safely and in due season, but because shortly afterwards my husband died of a certain shock he received, and had I time to tell you of it, I know your worship would be surprised. And here she began to weep bitterly, and said, Pardon me, Señor Don Quixote, if I am unable to control myself, for every time I think of my unfortunate husband my eyes fill up with tears. God bless me with what an air of dignity he used to carry my lady behind him on a stout mule as black as jet, for in those days they did not use coaches or chairs, as they say they do now and ladies rode behind their squires. This much, at least, I cannot help telling you, that you may observe the good breeding and punctiliousness of my worthy husband. As he was turning into the Cal de Santiago in Madrid, which is rather narrow, one of the alcaldes of the court, with two alguacils before him, was coming out of it, and as soon as my good squire saw him, he wheeled his mule about and made as if he would turn and accompany him. My lady, who was riding behind him, said to him in a low voice, What are you about, you sneak? Don't you see that I am here? The alcalde, like a polite man, pulled up his horse and said to him, Proceed, senor, for it is I, rather, who ought to accompany my lady Dona Casilda, for that was my mistress's name. Still my husband, cap in hand, persisted in trying to accompany the alcalde, and seeing this my lady, filled with rage and vexation, pulled out a big pin, or I rather think, a bodkin, out of her needle case and drove it into his back with such force that my husband gave a loud yell, and writhing fell to the ground with his lady. Her two lackeys ran to rise her up, and the alcalde and the alguacils did the same. The Guadalajara gate was all in commotion. I mean, the idlers congregated there. My mistress came back on foot, and my husband hurried away to a barber shop, protesting that he was run right through to the guts. The courtesy of my husband was noised abroad to such an extent that the boys gave him no peace in the street. And on this account, and because he was somewhat short-sighted, my lady dismissed him, and it was chagrin at this point, I am convinced, beyond a doubt, that brought on his death. I was left a helpless widow, with a daughter in my hands, growing up in beauty like the sea foam. At length, however, as I had the character of being an excellent needlewoman, my lady the Duchess, then lately married to my lord the Duke, offered to take me with her to this kingdom Aragon, and my daughter also. And here, as time went by, my daughter grew up, and with her all the graces in the world. She sings like a lark, dances quick as thought, puts it like a gypsy, reads and writes like a schoolmaster, and does sums like a miser. Of her neatness I say nothing, for the running water is not pure, and her age is now, if my memory serves me, sixteen years, five months, and three days, one more or less. To come to the point, the son of a very rich farmer, living in a village of my lord the duke's not very far from here, fell in love with this girl of mine, and in short, how I know not, they came together, and under the promise of marrying her, he made a fool of my daughter, and will not keep his word. And though my lord the duke is aware of it, for I have complained to him, not once but many and many a time, and entreated him to order that farmer to marry my daughter, he turns a deaf ear and will scarcely listen to me, the reason being that as the deceiver's father is so rich, and lends him money, and is constantly going security for his debts, he does not like to offend or annoy him in any way. Now, Signor, I want your worship to take it upon yourself to redress this wrong, either by entreaty or by arms, for by what all the world says you came into it to redress grievances and right wrongs and help the unfortunate. Let your worship put before you the unprotected condition of my daughter, her youth, and all the perfections I have said she possesses, and before God, on my conscience, out of all the damsels my lady has, there is not one that comes up to the sole of her shoe, and the one they call Alta Sedora, and look upon as the boldest and gayest of them, but in comparison with my daughter, does not come within two leagues of her. For I, I would have you know, Signor, all is not gold that glitters, and that same little Alta Sedora has more forwardness than good looks, and more impudence than modesty, besides being not very sound, for she has such a disagreeable breath that one cannot bear to be near her for a moment, and even my lady the Duchess, but I'll hold my tongue, for they say that walls have ears. For heaven's sake, Donna Rodriguez, what ails my lady the Duchess? asked Don Quixote. 
Adjured in that way, replied the duenna, I cannot help answering the question and telling the whole truth. Senor Don Quixote, have you observed the comeliness of my lady the Duchess, that smooth complexion of hers like a burnished polished sword, those two cheeks of milk and carmine, that gay lively step with which she treads or rather seems to spurn the earth, so that one would fancy she went radiating health wherever she passed? Well then, let me tell you she may thank first of all God for this, and next, two issues that she has, one in each leg, by which all the evil humors, of which the doctor says she is full, are discharged. Blessed virgin, exclaimed Don Quixote, and is it possible that my lady the Duchess has drains of that sort? I would not have believed it if the barefoot friars had told it to me, but as the lady Donna Rodriguez says so, it must be so. But surely such issues, and in such places, do not discharge humors, but liquid amber. Verily, I do believe now that this practice of opening issues is a very important matter for the health. Don Quixote had hardly said this when the chamber door flew open with a loud bang, and with a start the noise gave her Dona Rodriguez let the candle fall from her hand, and the room was left as dark as a wolf's mouth, as the saying is. Suddenly the poor duenna felt two hands seize her by the throat, so tightly that she could not croak, while someone else, without uttering a word, very briskly hoisted up her petticoats, and with what seemed to be a slipper, began to lay on so heartily that anyone would have felt pity for her. But although Don Quixote felt it, he never stirred from his bed, but lay quiet and silent, nay, apprehensive that his turn for a drubbing might be coming. Nor was the apprehension an idle one, one for leaving the duenna, who did not dare to cry out, well basted, the silent executioners fell upon Don Quixote, and stripping him of the sheet and the coverlet, they pinched him so fast and so hard that he was driven to defend himself with his fists, and all this in marvelous silence. The battle lasted nearly half an hour, and then the phantoms fled. Donna Rodriguez gathered up her skirts, and bemoaning her feet, went out without saying a word to Don Quixote, and he, sorely pinched, puzzled, and dejected, remained alone. And there we will leave him, wondering who could have been the perverse enchanter who had reduced him to such a state. But that shall be told in due season, for Sancho claims her attention, and the methodical arrangement of the story demands it. End of chapter 48 Recording by Arnold Simister, Toronto, Ontario, 